Chesapeake so bold, out of Boston, as we're told, came to take the British frigate neat and handy. Oh. And the people in the port all came out to see the sport, while their bands all played up Yankee Doodle Dandy. Oh. Before this action had begun, the Yankees made much fun, said we'll tow her up to Boston neat and handy. Oh. And after that we'll dine, treat our sweethearts all with wine, and we'll dance a jig a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Oh. Our British frigate's name that for the purpose came to cool the Yankees' courage and neat and handy. Oh, was the Shannon captain broke? All his crew had hearts of oak, and in fighting were allowed to be the dandy. Oh. Now the fight had scarce begun when they flinched from their guns. They thought that they had worked us neat and handy. Oh. But broke, he waved his sword, saying, Come, my boys, we'll board, and we'll stop them playing Yankee Doodle Dandy. Oh. When the Britons heard this word, they quickly sprang on board and seized the Yankees' ends and neat and handy. Oh. Notwithstanding all their brags, the British raised their flags on the Yankees' mizzen peak to be the Dandy. Oh. Now here's to Broke and all his crew, who in courage stout and true, fought against the Yankee frigate neat and handy. Oh, oh, may they ever prove, both in fighting and in love, that the British tars will always be the dandy. Oh. Okay, this week's game is Fighting Sail, Sea Combat in the Age of Canvas and Shot, 1775 to 1815. It was produced in 1981 by SPI, and the designer was Joseph Balkowski. It's an interesting game. It uh, was a magazine game at, originally at the time, so the rule set's a little bit shorter than normal. It uh, also feels a little bit like a reaction to Avalon Hill's Wooden Ships and Iron Men. I find it a little bit easier than Wooden Ships and Iron Men to uh, get on the table. Probably the main problem with this game is that there's just not enough uh, scenarios with it. It only has about half a dozen scenarios. A good game player would be able to sit down with the ships from, say, wooden, wooden Ships and Iron Men and make some more scenarios for it, because it's not a bad little uh, game, and it's a, probably one of the best games for introducing the uh, Age of Sail combat. So let's go through the rules a little bit here. Um, the game map is a 22 inch by 34 inch square grid. So we're on a grid instead of hexagons at this time. And it just represents your generic ocean. The playing pieces are little ships that actually participated in the given scenarios. And on the counters, there is the name of the ship. It shows where the bow and the stern of the ship will be placed when you're placing the counter on the map. Uh, these numbers down here are first the fire value. The second is the sailing value, that's the maneuverability of the ship. The next is the rate, that's the general quality of the ship. Then the crew value. And then finally there's a little nationality here that shows whether it's British, American, French, Dutch, etc. Uh, quick little naval terms, the bow is the front, the stern is the back. Just think of someone bowing, you bow to the front. And if you get a stern rebuke from your parents, they hit you in the butt or they hit you in the backside. The port is left, easy to remember because they both end in T and have four letters. And the starboard, which has an R in it, is right. So, again, looking at these uh, values, the fire value, um, I can kind of consider this similar to armor class or a two-hit number. And the number rolled and modified must be under the fire value of the attacker to succeed. This is one of the older style games. Sailing values the mobility of the vessel, and ships classified as a sailing value of A are more mobile than those that are, say, a C, which are the least mobile. Rate is the classification of the ship's strength in terms of weight and guns. The lower the rate number, the more powerful the ship. So think of a first-rate ship. If you think of something being first-rate, that's the most powerful. The crew value is the quality of the ship's crew, and it affects the ability to tack and wear. Those are uh, rapid turns. And 
The crew value is reduced whenever you hit the hull, you're killing off crew. So hull hits reduce crew. And it's also used in the saving throws if the wheel's been damaged. So it's used. It's also used in determining the melee combat strength. So when you're trying to board another ship, you're going to um, be dependent on the crew value. Fighting sails played in game turns, each of, each of which represents about seven minutes. Uh, we start with every every eight turns a strategic cycle occurs at the very beginning of the turn, and it's involved in a swell phase where. Any ships that are dead on the water are moved around. A uh, fire phase, and when we say fire phase in this connotation, we mean that the ship's on fire, and we can determine that if a ship on if a ship is on fire, whether it's going to blow up or not. And then the steading sail phase. The player may deploy or take in steading sails. Steading sails allow you to move a little faster. The second part of the game turn sequence is the command decision phase. So it's the phase where both players issue commands to all their ships. And then the, th the third part of the game turn sequence is the action stage. And at this point we reveal the commands. Then we then move according to what the commands are telling us. The uh, weather gauge is employed. Now what the weather gauge, and it's a G-A-G-E, not a G-A-U-G-E, this determines initiative. The player that has the weather gauge has the initiative, and they are able to determine who moves when. And then finally, all the ships will move. The melee phase, this is two parts. The first is the fire. This is firing from one ship to the other. And then melee, where actually if ships are together, or if we have two ships together, we refer to that as being fouled and the two ships can fight each other. The crews can go from one ship to the other and try to take over the ship. And then finally, there's an unfouling phase. And the unfouling phase is the where any ships that are stuck together can be pulled apart. So the way that a ship moves is determined by what are called commands. And what each player does is they secretly decide which command they're going to use. Uh, the five available commands are port, a head, starboard, a where command, and a tap command. And so what you do is you determine a chit, you pull the chit down here, and as long as the ship is not fouled or dead in the water or taken aback, taken aback means moving into the wind, then you can issue a command to that ship. After both players place their commands, they will then reveal them and carry out what the command says. Now each ship possesses a crew value, and a ship may not be issued a tack command if its crew value is 5 or less, and a ship may not be issued a wear command if its crew value is 4 or less. So you need plenty of crew to make these rapid turns. The next step is movement, and during the movement phase, all ships possessing command chits may fulfill their complete movement allowance and the requirements of their particular commands. and you can see what these are if you look on this table. And we have taken aback, beating, beam reach, broad reach, and running. And this determines, you look at your wind direction, and if the wind is pointing directly at the ship, then it's taken aback. It has to be pointing right towards the bow or front of the ship. And as you can see, there's a zero, zero, zero. And these qualities are for a, uh, a ship, a B ship, or a C ship. So if an A ship, and then you can see in all these cases that it's a zero, so the ship can has a movement of zero. Now if the direction of the wind was coming from, say, the upper left or the upper right, the, wind, the ship is beating into the wind, and for an A ship the movement is three, for a B ship the movement is three, and for a C ship the movement is three. Say the wind is coming from directly from the port or the starboard, the left or the right, then this is a beam reach. An A ship can move four, a B ship can move three, and a C ship can move three. If it's coming from the uh, rear port or rear starboard, then it's the A ship can move six, a B ship can move five, and a C ship can move four. And if the wind is coming directly from the back of the ship, then the ship is considered running 
and an A ship can move four, a B ship can move four, and a C ship can move three. So basically you sit down, look at the chart and the direction of the wind and determine how many movement points the ship has. So the weather gauge. This is an abstract indicator of which player has the position advantage or initiative during the turn. And to determine the weather gauge, each player examines the movement allowance of all their ships on the map. They determine the highest movement allowance that appears, and even if it's shared among several ships. And the player that has the highest of all the movement allowances is the one that possesses the weather gauge. So the player with the most number of ships with the highest movement allowances receives the weather gauge. If the number of ships for both players is equal that have high movement allowances, then you determine by just rolling a d6, and whoever gets the highest uh, roll wins. Now the player with the weather gauge controls the order of movement of all the ships possessing commands on the board, not only his own, but the other players. So for instance, let's look at these ships, and we can say that player one has a ship that has a movement of four, a movement of three, and a movement of one. The other player has a four, a four, and a three. So the second player gets the weather gauge because they have the four and the four, and they can choose to move, say they choose to move both of their fours. They could let the other player move in between, but they decide to move theirs. We then go to the next lower movement point, the one with the threes, and the player with the weather gauge can again determine who goes first. And then we go on, so on, with the lower and lower movement rates. Now movement in this game is incremental. And a player may expend a partial movement and then either move another ship or cede initiative to another player. While the ship can make in incremental movements through a turn, all possible movement points have to be extend expended by the end of the turn. Entering a square through a square side costs two movement points, while entering a square through an angle costs three movement points. And in order to enter an adjacent square, a ship must have enough movement points remaining in its allowance. If a ship doesn't have the movement points to enter the square it faces, its movement for the phase is terminated. So they're done moving. The movement phase is completed when all ships on the map have completed their movement and their command chips have been removed. And when you're finished, you remove the command ship. Chit. It's kind of hard to say chit versus ship or something else. A head movement, if a ship possesses an ahead move command, it must go ahead as far as its movement allowance will allow, and it can make no changes in facing. A port command, anywhere during their turn, they have to make either a 45 or a 90 degree counterclockwise facing change. And changing the facing of the ship does not cost movement points. And there's no specific requirement as to when you want to turn during that. Starboard command, same thing as support command. You can turn 45 or 90 degrees clockwise. Attack command, at the start of its movement, the ship may expend all of its movement points and tack, and you can turn 135, 180, or even 225 degrees. During attack maneuver, the ship ends up in the same square that it started movement in. And in order to accomplish attack maneuver, the crew command value of the ship must be at least five. One thing a ship cannot do is they can't enter, they can't end their attack maneuver facing the, with the bow facing the wind. This is being called taken aback. Although you can move the bow through the direction of the oncoming wind without being taken aback. So you're tacking into the wind. So if you were to turn, say, 180 degrees and the wind was facing you at 90 degrees, you could go ahead and do it. However, if, say, you were running uh, uh, with the wind, and wanted to turn 180 degrees, you could not tack in that direction. A wear command, at the start of its movement, a ship may expend all of its movement point and wear. And when you wear, you turn 135, 180, or even 225 degrees. And the ship ends up in an adjacent square directly downwind from where they started, facing the other direction, or facing the direction that they intend. If a ship starts the wear maneuver with the wind directly behind their stern, they can end their turn square to either the ship's port or the starboard. And here I show this. And in order to accomplish a wear maneuver, the crew value has to be at least four. 
the ship cannot end a wear maneuver with its bow facing into the wind or being taken aback, that the bow can move across the direction of the oncoming wind without being taken aback. Backing sail. If a, pl if a player wishes to stop their ship, they may back sail at any interval in their movement phase. And back sail is restricted to ships that are either beating or beam reaching. The ship may not move any further during the rest of the turn, but they may fire normally if they haven't fired already during the turn. Heaving 2. If a player begins the movement phase beating, they have the option of foregoing movement for the turn and heaving 2. Heaving 2 reorients their bow 45 degrees. And to heave to the port, ships, the wind must be coming from the starboard. And to heave to the starboard, the wind must be coming from the port. After heaving 2, a ship may fire normally if it hasn't fired during that turn. So what if you are taken aback by the wind? You're facing directly into it with your bow. You cannot give commands during that turn, and you have to wait and drift out of that position. If during any part of a port or starboard command you are taken aback, then the move for that turn also ends at that point, and you may not fire if you haven't already. So drifting, say you are taken aback, or you fail to perform a command after, say, being hit and suffering a wheel critical hit, then the ship has to drift. And a ship that's drifted may not move voluntarily for the remainder of the game turn, uh, nor may it perform fire combat. When a ship drifts, the owning, pl owning player rolls a d6, and on a 1 to 2, that means that the ship continues to stay pointing in the original direction. So if you're taking it back, you're taking it back for another turn. If you get a 3 to 4, you turn the ship 45 degrees to the port, and a 5 to 6 indicates the ship turns to 45 degrees to the starboard. So at that point, the ship can continue to act in subsequent turns. Say you occupy the same space as another ship, then you are fouled. In other words, your masts and rigging are tangled up with each other. Fouled ships may neither move nor receive orders until they become unfouled and a maximum of four ships may occupy the same square. They can be enemy ships or they can be friendly ships. You can avoid fouling um, by carrying out a command during your turn and you are automatically given a free 45 degree turn either to the port or the starboard immediately before moving into the uh, square of the enemy ship. So there is a foul save. However, if a ship is taken aback because of this foul save, then they are start to drift and their movement's terminated. So to unfoul, at the end of the turn, you roll a d6, and on a 1 to 3, you are unfouled from friendly ships. If you roll, a, you have to roll a 1 to unfoul from enemy ships. And if a ship is unfouled, the player places the ship in an adjacent square, and they're free to face the ship any direction they wish. Fire combat. This is the heart of the game. Ships can fire once during their game turn, and they can do it at any point during their movement. However, ships always have to enter a new square during movement. At the first, in other words, the first move has to always be in a new square, and fire has to occur after you've made that move. Only one ship fires at a time, so fire is not sim simultaneous between ships. You declare a target, uh, then you immediately note whether you're aiming for the hull or the rigging of the enemy ship, and you then verify that the target's within range, it's within the field of fire, and it's within a line of sight. Two die are rolled, a large one and a small one, keep track of which die is which, and you read these results as a two-digit number, the large die being the first digit, the small die being the second digit. For example, if you roll a large die of four and a small die of six, then the result is 46. That's then compared to the, the attacking ship's fire value, which can be modified, and if it's lower, a hit occurs. A dice roll higher than the fire value is a miss. Range. Maximum range of all fire is 20 range points. Range points are identical to movement points, and they're traced across squares. So, in other words, across the square would be two range points, Across the square angle would be three range points. 
Range modifies the die roll to hit an enemy ship. And to determine this modifier, you divide the range points from ship to ship by 4, you round down, and then you multiply by 10. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is, but basically, if you go 0 to 4 range points, then there's no modifier. If you go 4 to 8, there's a minus 10 modifier. If you go 8 to 12, there's a minus 20, and so on. Each ship has a field of fire of approximately 90 degrees on its port and starboard sides, and all ships must be within these fields of fire. And as you can see here, there's a bow blind side and a stern blind side, and I'm showing this straight on with the hexes versus at a 45 degree angle. So here's the two fields from different sides. A ship can fire only its port or starboard broadside in a given game turn, not both. So in other words, you can only make a port attack or a starboard attack, not this, not both at the same time. Line of sight is important. The firing player must connect the center of the square occupied by the firing ship with the center of the square occupied by the target ship. And just this is the standard old use a straight edge if you need to. If this passes through a square that's occupied by either a friendly or an enemy ship, no fire can take place. Okay, let's talk about modifiers to an attacking ship's fire rating. And it's important to remember that modifiers only apply to the fire rating of the attacking ship. They don't apply to die rolls. The first thing we look at is the difference in the rate of the firing ship to the rate of the ship that's being fired upon. And basically the rate of the firing ship is subtracted from the rate of the target ship. And for every difference in rate, uh, there's a modifier of plus or minus 10. So in other words, let's say a fourth rate ship is attacking a fifth rate ship. The fourth rate ship's a better ship, so they get to add 10 to their fire value. If, say, it was a fifth rate ship attacking a fourth rate ship, the fifth rate ship is not as high a quality as the fourth rate ship, and therefore they would reduce their fire value by 10. Damage affects the firing ship, and for every two hull points that the firing ship has sustained of damage, uh, the fire rating is subtracted by 10. So in other words, you lose two hit points, then your fire value is goes down by 10. Targeting the defender's rigging also modifies the fire rating. And if you're trying to make a rigging attack, you have to be within six range points and 10 is subtracted from your fire rating. If your firing ship has just performed attack command, 10 is subtracted from the ship's fire rating. And if you're doing a rake, now rakes are if you're firing directly at the stern or directly at the bow of an opponent ship. If you're firing directly at the stern from a blindside area, you can add 20 to your fire value. If you're performing a bow rake, firing at the target's bow blindside, you can add 10 to your fire rating. Finally, the first broadside of the game from a ship allows the uh, firing ship to hone in and uh, focus on the target ship. So if the firing ship is performing its first broadside at three range points or fewer, 20 is added to its fire value. The first broadside is performed at between, if the first broadside is performed at between four and six range points, that's inclusive, 10 is added to its fire value. All ships whose fire values are followed by an asterisk are carronade armed, not cannonade, but carronade. Such ships have a maximum range of eight range points, and at ranges of three range points or fewer, 10 is automatically added to these ships' fire values. Luckily, these modifiers are um, placed on a player aid, so we can use them. And when I show you guys how the game's played, I'll go through this a lot. Damage. After a fire sh firing ship's final fire value has been determined with all the modifiers, the owning player rolls one large and one small die, and you read it as a two-digit result, and the result is compared to the firing ship's final fire value. A result greater than this value indicates no effect, and a result equal to or up to 40 less than the value indicates one hit on the target ship. A result between 41 and 80, inclusive, less than the value indicates two hits on the target ship, and a result of 81 
or more less than the value is uh, three tar hits on the target ship. Any double dice rolls on a two die six count as a critical hit. And damage is applied to where attacking players called the attack, either the hull or the rigging. Hull hits affect the fire value of the ships and reduce the crew value by one for every hit inflicted. Rigging hits. For every two cumulative points of rigging damage, the ship's maximum movement allowance is reduced to four. For a cumulative of four points of rigging damage, maximum movement allowance is reduced to three. Now back to the critical hits. If a critical hit occurs, you roll another two die six. And on a two to six, a wheel critical hit occurs. On a seven to 10, a mass critical hit occurs. And on 11 to 12, the ship catches on fire. A mass critical hit indicates the loss of a mass. Mast. A given ship may lose no more than three masts. And if a ship has lost one mast, its maximum movement allowance is four if its sailing value was A or B, or three if its sailing value was C. If a ship has lost two masts, its maximum movement allowance is three regardless of the sailing value. And a ship, if a ship has lost three masts, it's considered dead in the water. And note that if a ship has lost any number of masts in addition to possessing two or more rigging hits, it's also dead in the water. The moment a wheel critical hits received, the target ship immediately begins to drift. In addition, at the end of every future command decision stage, the owning player must roll a single die for each of his sh ships that possess a wheel critical hit. On a die roll that's greater than the current crew value of such a ship, the ship immediately drifts for the turn. And on a die roll equal to or less than the crew value, the command succeeds and the ship's unaffected. If a ship receives a wheel critical hit after having received one earlier in the game, it's converted to a mast critical hit. And if a ship receives a fire critical hit, one hull hit is also inflicted on it. Let's talk about melee combat. Melee combat is when you're attempting to board another ship and fight. Fouled ships may fire on enemy ships within the firing phase, within the same space that they're in. Unfouled ships may not fire into this space. They, in other words, unfouled ships cannot fire into a mass of fouled ships. Fouled ships fire in the order of their current crew values and may choose which enemy ship in the square they wish to attack, if there's more than one. The range between fouled sh opponents is one, and fouled ships may only inflict hull damage on each other. They can't inflict rigging damage. If they want to board, during the melee phase, enemy ships in the same square must attempt to board each other. They, it's not a choice. Each boarding value is determined by subtracting the ship's rate from the current crew value. All ships of the attacker ship's boarding values in the same square are added together, and one die six is added to this. The opponent does the same thing, and the values are compared. If the sum is 150% larger than the other, the player with the higher sum captures all of the opponent's ships as a prize. If the sum is less than 100%, both sides remain fouled. If one player's sum is negative or zero, and one player is positive, the player with the positive sum captures all the other player's ships. And if both player sums are negative or zero, they remain fouled. Real quick, a reminder about being dead in the water. A ship's considered dead in the water and may not move if it's fouled, if it's lost three masts, if it's lost two or more rigging points and a mast, if it's captured, or if it's been abandoned. And ships that are dead in the water may fight, and they're affected by swells, but they just can't move. Abandoning ship or striking colors. So a ship's considered abandoned once it receives a number of hull hits equal to 10 minus the ship's rate. Rigging damage never is a cause for abandonment. Abandoned mess vessels may not move or fire, but they're still considered under the command of the player that owns them. And if an enemy unit enters the adjacent square to the abandoned ship, then that enemy unit uh, immediately takes that ship as a prize. Prize ships have a value of 1 on crew value, and they maintain their original rate. They can move, but they can't fire on other ships, but they can be retaken through another boarding combat. Real quick on the strategic cycle, it occurs on every 8 turns, so in real time that's every hour. On all other game turns, it's skipped. Three things can occur. One is the swell, and only ships that are dead in the water are affected by swell. During the swell phase, each player rolls a single die for each of his ships that's dead in the water. A die roll of one or two indicates no effect. The ship remains in the hex. A result of three, four, or five, three, four, five, or six indicates that the ships immediately move one square to the leeward, downwind, maintaining the same direction. 
This means the ships moved into the adjacent square away from the wind. During a swell phase, these ships that are fouled are not rolled for individually. Instead, either player rolls a single die and all the fouled ships are moved together. Burning ships. During the fire phase, a player must roll a single die for each of his ships that's burning. On a die roll of one, the ship explodes and is removed from the map. On any other die roll, the ship receives one hull hit. If the addition of one hull hit to a ship on fire reduces the ship to abandonment level, the ship immediately explodes and is removed from the map. So the only way in this game a ship can actually sink and be removed from the map is through these explosions. And if any other vessels are fouled with the ship that blows up, they are also considered sunk. Studding sails. During the studding sail phase, each player may declare that any of the ships on the map will employ studding sails for the next eight game turns. And if studding sails are already being used by a ship at the beginning of this phase, the owning player may declare that he's taking in these sails at the time, thereby permitting the ships to operate normally again. If a ship uses studding sails is fired upon by an enemy vessel employing rigging fire, there's no negative modifier to the enemy's fire value due to the use of rigging fire. During the movement allowance determination phase, a ship using studding sails is affected as follows. If it's beating, it's considered to be beam reaching. If it's beam reaching, it's considered to be running. And if it's running, it's considered to be broad reaching. And if it's broad reaching, there's no effect. Okay, let's run through the first scenario. And this is the don't give up the ship scenario. It takes place on the 1st of June of 1813 uh, when the USS Chesapeake, captained by James Lawrence, uh, clashed with the HMS Shannon, captained by Philip Broke. Uh, this occurred in Boston Harbor and during the War of 1812. It was a 20 minute engagement and the Shannon essentially battered the Chesapeake into submission. They then boarded her and took her as a prize. Uh, Captain Lawrence was famous for his battle cry of, don't keep up. Captain Lawrence was famous for his battle cry of, don't give up the ship, which became a rallying cry for the US Navy for years afterwards. Unfortunately, Lawrence was killed in the uh, conflict and the Chesapeake was hauled off to Nova Scotia, where a number of the dead sailors were buried. Okay, let's go through the whole uh, little scenario here and we'll play it out. We've got the Chesapeake up here and the Shannon down here and <clears throat> both players will decide what they want to try to do. Um, I'm gonna say that the Chesapeake is gonna try to maneuver around on kind of a, make a wide uh, starboard turn here. So we will make them, I actually think I'm going to turn to the port. Okay, then the Shannon. And the Shannon's going to try to cross the T of the Chesapeake, and so they're going to make a hard port. And I apologize, I think I'm going to make this a starboard. now. If the players were playing each other and we weren't playing the solitaire, they would not know what orders were being given by each side. Okay, then we're going to determine our speeds. And luckily, the Vassal module does a nice job of just figuring this out for you. So the Shannon has a speed uh, movement points of six. The Chesapeake has movements of points of four. So the uh, Shannon gains the weather gauge, and the player with the Shannon can choose when and how they want to move. They do have to move into the um, square that they're pointing in their first move, so we'll have them do that. Oops. There we go. And then they can make a, the turn. And I'm going to make them turn to the port and move forward again. And then they're out of points. They'll then let the Chesapeake move. And the Chesapeake is moving to the starboard, so got to make one move forward, and then they can turn here to the starboard. Let's delete that. And the Shannon still has an opportunity. Actually, they both have an opportunity to fire. So the Shannon's going to fire their port cannons, and we are going to figure out when I mean, we're going to use this modifier table here. So we start with 55, and we 
subtract the rate of the firing ship from the rate of the target ship, which is 55. I'm sorry, which is 5. This is a fifth rate ship. This is a fifth rate ship. So in the game, there's no difference in the rates of the ship. So we don't have to worry about this rate modifier. Now there's a range modifier of 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5. So we divide by the range points by 4, and you and then you drop the fractions down. So in other words, every four um, range points uh, reduces the uh, firing factor by 10. So that's going to be, take this down to 45, from 55 to 45. Uh, neither side has taken any damage, so we don't worry about that. We don't have to worry about the firing at the rigging because we're going to fire we're going to assume we're firing at the hull it has not tacked and it's not a rake so we can see the shannon if it was any of these hexes or squares out here that would be considered a rake it is the first broadside and it's performed at four to six range points so at five it's going to add ten so we're back to fifty five so we need to roll under fifty five and re-roll a 1 and a 2. So that's a 12. So just do a real quick little math here. 55 minus 12 equals 43. Okay, that's a pretty good hit. So we look on our damage and we see that it's it's above 40, so that's equal to two hits on the hull. So we're going to go and check our damage on the Chesapeake. They take two hull hits. They reduce the crew by two. And on the Shannon, they have used a port broadside. <coughs> okay. Chesapeake can do the same thing. They're going to make a starboard broadside. Two, three, four, five. We'll go back and check. So 54 minus 10 is 44. However, it's a first broadside, and that's going to take it back. So 54 is going to be the final uh, um, attack factor. We'll roll. We get a 45. So 45 is under. So that's going to be one hit the Shannon takes. So we go to the damage of the Shannon, and we give it one. We brought the crew down by one. And um, the Chesapeake has made a starboard broadside. Okay. And that's the first round of combat. Let's go to the second round. So we're going to end our turn. And let's see, what's the Chesapeake want to do? Well, this is going to end up here. I'm going to try to foul and see if we can board it. Let's see what happens if we do that. So we're going to make another... We're going to make another... Turn to the starboard. Okay. Again, we're going to try to cross the T, so we're going to make another port and then we figure our speeds six to four the chesapeake gets to move first and i think we can actually again cross the t and make a nasty little shot here so we're going to go forward one which we have to do and since we have the weather gauge with the chesapeake we're going to continue moving and right there beautiful and we are going to fire. Okay, let's delete that. And combat. And we're firing at the hull again. No difference. The range. No difference in range. Damage. How much damage has the Chesapeake taken? Let's look here. The Chesapeake's taken two, so we've subtract 10. So it's now 44. It is a bow rake, so that's going to be 10, so that takes us back to 54. 
and we can fire at 41. That's going to be lower than that, so the Shannon takes a point. Okay, Shannon's going to have to has a problem here, and that is that they are going to going to be fouled. So let's go through the fouling rules. Okay, so the Shannon is fouled with the Chesapeake here. So first of all, they will try to uh, make a uh, attack on the uh, Chesapeake's hull. So the range is one, so no differences there. The Shannon's taken two, so they lose ten. And we've got a 43. So again, the Chesapeake takes ten. And then we're going to make a boarding attack. Okay, to determine uh, how the melee is going to go after this, we are going to start with the Shannon. Now the you take the crew value, which is 8, minus the class of the ship, which is 5. So 8 minus 5 is 3, and then you're going to add 1d6, and we're just going to use the first dice here. So that's 1. So 8 minus 5 is 3 plus 1 is 4. For the Chesapeake, we're going to take 6 minus 5 is 1. We'll roll again. 1 plus 5 is 6. And then you're going to, the one with the higher roll 
if it's 150% over the roll of the other one, or the final score of the other one, then the ship is has been taken over and taken as a prize. And so in this case, the Chesapeake is at 6, the Shannon is at 4. So 4 plus 2, that's 150%. So the Chesapeake takes the Shannon as a prize, just like in, this is pretty much how it happened in real life, and begins to haul it off to Nova Scotia. And that's a real quick on how to play Fighting Sail. So we could, let's play another, let's just go ahead and play another one here. Okay, this time we're going to be doing the scenario between the Wasp and the Frolic. It's uh, 18th of October, 1812. The USS Wasp, captained by Jacob Jones, is engaged with the Frolic, captained by Thomas uh, Wynne Yates, on the 18th of October. And they're in rough seas off the mouth of the Delaware River. There's a 45-minute battle, and both vessels are battled, but the Wasp wins the upper hand and boards the antagonist. Ironically, a few hours after engagement, the Wasp herself falls prey to the British ship of the line, the Poitres, which arrives on the scene as the battle is coming to a close. Okay, let's do it. Let's see how this one pulls. Okay, we are going to start with the Wasp, and I think the Wasp is going to try to... If the Frolic goes this way, which I think she will... I can probably pull around and pull a hard hard port. So the Wasp will do a port. Now the Frolic's thinking, I can really pull a hard starboard here and give it a broadside. So we're going to do a hard starboard. Who has the wind? Okay, they both are, have a four for their movement. First one is for the Wasp, second one for the uh, Frolic. Six to three, the wasp gets to go. Wasp has to go into the adjacent uh, square in the first move. Okay. And then there's going to have to be a turn, and the wasp can go no further. Also, the wasp can't fight. Okay, now let's see what the... what the frolic can do. Goes into the adjacent turns, and they can turn 90, and it's going to go forward. That the uh, Frolic is, can shoot at the Wasp, it looks like here, but the Wasp cannot shoot at the Frolic. Um, this is, this is going to be a first broadside, and it is her bow rate, so let's see. Okay, first of all, we need to check the difference of the rates. The rate of the firing ship from the rate of the target ship. Sixth rate ship against the sixth rate. So during this game, they're the same. The range, two, five, so 10, so 52 minus 10. Okay, damage, neither, neither ship's taken damage. We're making a whole shot. We have not tacked, we are doing a rake. And since it's a bow rake, we're gonna add 10, so that takes us back to 52. It's a uh, first broadside from the port. It's going to be 2, 5, so that's going to be another 10. So we're now at 62. And you see the little asterisk here um, by the attack value, and that means there's a carronade. It's a special type of cannon. And at three range points or less, they add 10. And they have a maximum range of 8. So is it going to be in the maximum range? Yes, but it's not going to add 10. So I think we had a, let's do this one more time here. This is a lot to keep track of. Rate is same, range is gonna be minus 10. No damage, first broadside, so adds 10. And then it's gonna add 10 for a bow rate, so 62. 21, ooh, okay. 62 minus 21, 41. 
So the wasp takes two. Wasp doesn't have much of a hole there. Okay, we have used the Frolic's uh, port broadside. And we go to round two. Let's see, this time the wasp is going to end up there. You know, we're going to be able to make, I think we're going to rake, well, three. So this is all the further the wasp is going to go. Let's just go straight ahead. And the frolic is going to go forward and make a port. We need to end our turn here. Speed six. Oh! And we made a terrible mistake here. Um, the frolic is pointing into the wind, so the frolic is dead in the water right now. So they pretty much lose the turn. I'm going to let the wasp do its stuff. Enters, going to turn. They're going to fire. And uh, let's see, so rate is no, the range is zero, so we're at 52. Rigging fire, we're going to make a hull fire. Attacking, nope. It's a, it's a first broadside at 20, so that's going to be 72. And it's a carronade at less than three points, so that's 82. Let's do this. Oh, we need a roll. We got a 44. So 82 minus 44. That could have been bad. 38. So the Frolic takes, the Frolic is going to take two points. Let's see, that was Port Broadside. And then the Wasp can move on down here. And that will end the turn. Okay. Oh, and then the wasp, I'm sorry, the frolic has to see if they go out of the wind. Okay, we roll one to see if the uh, wasp or the frolic drifts. We'll look at the first die. Four. So one to two means they continue straight ahead. Nothing. So they would be stuck for another round. Three to four means a port 45 degrees to the port. So they can now move this way. So at least they're no longer um, stuck facing the wind. Okay, there's the end of the turn. We decide what we're going to do. Um, so he's the, the Frolic's deciding that they're going to try to make a port turn. They can, I suppose they could try to attack. Let's try that. Let's just try to make attack here. We can attack through the wind. So they're going to spend their turn tracking. Do they have the crew to do it? Let's see. The Frolic has a crew of six. So yeah, they're still five or greater. They would need to attack. And the Wasp. Wasp is going to make a, a port turn. Okay, let's see. Speeds. Frolic is three, Wasp is four, so Wasp has the weather gauge. Moves forward. Makes their turn. Can't move any further. Going to make a shot. Let's see, has the Wasp... Okay, the Wasp has already made a port side shot. Three 
3, 4, 5. So minus 10. 52 minus 10 is 42. Wasp has taken 2 points damage, so 32. They're making a hole fire. It's not considered a rake. It's not a first broadside. It's not going to be close up for the carronades. So 42 it is. Gets a 32. Doing one point of damage to the uh, Frolic. Okay, the Frolic is at five still, so they can still make that uh, attack. They attack. They can make a shot here. So they've got three, four, five, minus ten. It's a uh, first broadside, though, from the starboard. Okay, so that's 52. They have taken hull damage, so that's back to 42. And so they need to roll a 42 or less. 41! Ooh, barely. But they're able to extract a point of damage to the wasp. And that's the round. Okay, next turn. What's the frolic want to do? Make a starboard turn. They, they can, I think again, they can, they can do it. Starboard turn. Wasp will make a port turn. And we see who has got speed, so they're tied up. Five for the Frolic, four for the Wasp. So the Frolic gets the weather gauge, moves, turns, moves, shoots. Two, four, 52, minus 10 is 42. That's going to be 32 with the hull damage. Oops. Gets a 16. Wasp takes another shot, makes another shot. So the wasp is now dead in the water, can't move. So the frolic ends up. They can capture, uh, the frolic can capture the wasp, but beyond that, it's pretty much over. And that's it. So, so that's Fighting Sail. I think it's a little bit easier game to grasp than Wooden Ships and Iron Men by Avalon Hill. I actually kind of like playing it better. I think if you have two opponents playing with this uh, surprise system of giving orders, it's a little bit better than the Avalon Hill system of writing down orders and sending them out to the ships, although it's maybe not quite as accurate. All in all, it's a pretty good game. I'd play it again. Anyway, that's this week's video. Thanks again for watching. If you have any games you'd like to see me play, then just put it down below and I will see what I can do. Talk to you guys later.